Hi everyone, this is Karen with The Rugger's Edge. This is my second installment of the, these video webinar chats. Uh, I am so excited that uh, we started having some people that are watching these videos. Hopefully it's a little bit easier to digest some of the information by video as opposed to uh, reading in the newsletter. So hopefully you guys are enjoying this. Um, I have a very special guest with me today. This is a friend, it's a colleague, uh, my friend um, Hope Murtaugh. She runs Murtaugh College um, Consulting right? Or counseling? Yes. Okay, all right. See? <laughs> um, and she is so knowledgeable. She used to work in admissions at Princeton University. I thought it'd be wonderful to bring her in and just offer some perspectives about, um, you know, college admissions, but specifically um, selective college admissions. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. So Hope, why don't you just kind of um, introduce yourself uh, to, to the group or whoever's watching this and uh, okay. go from there. Great. Um, well, I graduated from Princeton in 1986, and within a couple of years, I was recruited to work in the admission office as an admission officer, and I was in charge of recruiting the Southeast eventually, because that's where I am from, where I am from, and uh, I also, when we had to move, uh, we moved from New Jersey down to North Carolina, and I almost immediately began working for a local private school there as their assistant director of college counseling. So I've done admissions work and high school counseling, specifically college counseling. And then I've been an independent educational counselor for quite a few years now. So that's actually where we met, of course. So, yeah. So, I mean, obviously one of the, the things that is, I think stands out a lot about college rugby is the idea that um, really your top a lot of, you know, kind of the, the top of the, the rung in terms of college programs, they're also very selective schools. So colleges that always come up on the list for students that are looking at continuing to play, you have Cal Berkeley, you might have UCLA, you would have University of Michigan, you have Dartmouth, Harvard, you know, Tufts, um, Colgate. I mean, these are all schools that um, routinely are accepting, you know, I mean, at least 20% or less of applicants. Um, so while I think generally speaking, um, when I you know, meet with families or do these presentations, I think it's out there in the world now with the internet and books and stuff, you know, people kind of have a general sense of, okay, like, of course my, you know, Joey needs a good GPA or he needs a, you know, a, a perfect test score. Um, to get into some of these schools and I think sometimes that's where it stops. You know, I have a lot of families that might say, well, you know, Joey did everything right. You know, he got a perfect SAT or ACT and he has a, you know, 4.5 million GPA. How come he didn't get into that school? Um, so I really wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit about, you know, um, your experience, you know, what are, what are some things you wish families knew about this process? Cause I think it's not as, cut and dry as, as it, you know, some families believe. Yeah, and I, I actually have a good way that I try to explain this because it, it doesn't make sense sometimes when you look at a, a decision in isolation, you know, you don't understand what else was done in that applicant pool, so you don't, you don't understand what was done. Um, I sometimes say that, okay, let's imagine that you're running a marathon. Well, you might be the top marathoner in the state of California and you're the best one in high school. If you go over to New York to run the New York City Marathon, you probably know you're not coming in first, no matter how great you are. It doesn't undermine how great you are. And in fact, when you run that marathon, you might do your personal best ever and still not win that marathon um, or not even come in in the top you know, 50 or 100 because the competition and you can see the competition around you, right? You're running against that wonderful guy from the international runner who's a couple years older than you, or you're running against the other state champions. I mean, so you see the competition and you can still feel good about how well you did in that marathon without understanding, you know, without uh, feeling bad about yourself. You can, you can, you can feel good about how you did because you've seen the competition. So now imagine that you run that marathon and you have blinders on and you can't see any of your competition. So all you know is that I, I think I'm doing okay. I'm doing my pace. I think I'm okay. You know, wow, I did my personal best. I, I'm really happy with my time. And then you find out, I'm sorry, you weren't in the top 2000 in the race. How could that be? So this is the situation in the selective college admission. You don't see your competition. So 
one of the other things that I usually explain is there really are a couple of barriers or thresholds that you have to get over to be admitted to these top schools. And while most people out there might think, hey, grades and, and test scores are it, right? No, <laughs> that's the first, that's kind of the first hurdle, right? So your first hurdle is to uh, have the grades and the test scores to be competitive. They do not rank order applicants from number one to number you know, 150,000 and admit them from the top down based on their academic credentials, right? So that's the first hurdle. And once you're over that hurdle, if you have the academic credentials, then they almost become irrelevant because hmm. everybody has them. So you move on to the next barrier or the next hurdle or consideration, and that would be the subjective stuff, right? What are you like in the classroom? What do your teachers say about you in their recommendations? What are you like as a person? And how do you express that in your essays? And that is, I think, almost like a job interview, right? So you can understand, everyone out there who's listening to this who's applied for a job understands that sometimes you have the credentials for the job, but the people doing the hiring may not want you for that job for subjective reasons. They may have a negative, or it just may be that you're not the one that they're looking for. Um, maybe you don't have, maybe you have a different skill set. You know, we were just talking about athletic teams, and if I am a coach and I need a certain position to fill on my team, let's just say I'm a baseball coach and I'm looking for really great batters and I'm full up with great pitchers, then the great pitcher might show up in my recruiting pool, but you know, I'm full and I really need to use my spots for my batters. Right. It's not a negative against that fantastic pitcher. The pitcher just didn't find the college that was looking for the pitchers. Same thing in a job interview. You've got to find the company that's looking for your particular skill set and your particular subjective, you know, credentials. The last barrier, just the last one I'll mention. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, is what the college needs. And that's that position, right? What are, as a college, do I need more engineers this year? Do I need more dancers? Or hey, let's take the University of Michigan, which you mentioned. A few years ago, they over-enrolled. In other words, they extended offers of admission and too many people said yes. And all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we're converting libraries to dormitories or something. Yeah, I don't know what they did. Yeah, yeah. they over-enrolled. <laughs> so they got a little too big and they had to trim back on those admission decisions um, and cut back. And we saw that in the, in the decision pool a few years ago. Right. Well, so, I mean, the, the question that I have is, um, I mean, so the, so let's go back. Let, let's say we, we have like a, a Joey. I always, poor Joey. I talk poor about Joey. all <laughs> my presentations. I've always talked about a Joey or a Susie. Um, <laughs> so let's say I've got, you know, the student Joey, he's great. He really, he really did do everything right. You know, right. He, you know, had a uh, very rigorous curriculum. He goes to a good school. Um, you know, he has a good GPA, you know, perfect test score. Um, so let's say Joey applied to Hope um, University. Like, what, what would be a potential, I guess, like a reason he wouldn't be admitted? Like, you mentioned some of the su su subjective things, like essays and letters of rec. Like, in your experience, like, if you can recall, I mean, are there certain ones you remember? Like, yes, on paper, the student might have looked perfect, but this was a reason we, we did deny him. Like, are, are there things that people don't think about, I guess? Mm-hmm. Well, there are a lot of things that I can, can think of, um, but the first point I want to make is that the vast majority of denials or rejections at those top highly competitive schools, they're not based on an actual negative in the application, mm. right? It is exactly like a job search. You have the credentials, but we chose another person to offer that job to, and therefore, even though we liked you, even though you had the credentials, it's the negative fallout of the fact that we chose somebody else to offer that position to. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Eighty percent of the applicants could fall into that category. Very likable, um, have all the credentials, but when you choose, you know, if you, if you have twenty applicants for every seat in your class, when you choose that one 
ballerina who's internationally recognized and 20 people, you know, 19 other people get denied, including the 10 that you just loved that were awesome, that were amazing. And they get the same denial or rejection that the kid who really wasn't qualified, who was 20th in line for that spot. They get the same rejection. So, um, so that having been said, yes, mostly it's, these are positive, you know, uh, positive things about kids. They just aren't the ones selected for that spot. Okay. There are sometimes things that could be a reason why someone isn't selected. One of the saddest reasons I think would be a student who hasn't put the time and effort into their application that they should. Mm -hmm. I sometimes see this happen with students who are very talented, but they're busy, 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 and they don't de dedicate the proper time to the application, to the essays, to thinking about this and really reflecting on themselves and sharing all that depth of insight in their essays. And so if you do an application the night before, or if you, you know, if you dash off your first draft and, you know, I'm a good student, I, my English teacher loves the papers that I do the night before. She's always saying, wow, your thoughts are so organized. You're just amazing. Well, guess what? College admission is a competitive writing exercise. It is a writing competition. Hmm. So mostly, are you gonna be successful if you show up the night before and turn in your first draft? Maybe an English class you could be in high school. It's probably not gonna carry the day at you know, one of these highly selective schools. So I do think putting the time and effort in because I, I often said, wow, this looks like a fantastic kid, fantastic recommendations, but it's a hasty application, hasty. They didn't do it justice. It's the same thing as showing up for a job interview and oh, I'm not gonna bother to shower and put on a nice outfit today. <laughs> I'm just gonna, oh, yeah, you know, they should take me as I am and you know, Right. I'll just I mean, it, it may, you're making me that there is a, another consultant I happened to talk to um, and she was just sharing that she had a student um, who was applying to, let's say, like a very um, a Catholic institution. Right. So like a Notre Dame. And mm -hmm. then they were just copying and pasting essays from previous schools. Right. And they, they, they basically made a mention of uh, going to a Christian school. And, and I know it's, it's, it's related, but it's not exactly the same. And so the, the feedback was, you know, had that gone through, it, it may have just pointed out, like, uh, did you really research this school? You know, or even like, even worse than that would be like, I can't wait to go to University of Notre Dame, but that one went to like Duke, you know, right? Copying and pasting. It's, it's so easy with right. the technology we have. And I think you're totally right on, um, I love what you said about it being a writing competition. And that means you need to take care and prepare. Um, it's a big deal. And I think a lot of families probably don't realize what a big deal it really can be, especially when you say, after you get past that first obstacle, it's almost like everyone's now at a new starting line. Yes. Right. It's exactly. Yeah. Once you get past the grades and once you've got the grades in the essays, Hey, you're qualified for the job those become irrelevant. We're trying to tell the difference between people. And we didn't focus much on that third line, that third hurdle, but it's, it, what are the institutional needs? Um, I worked with a student last year who was one of those great students, but she could be accepted anywhere or rejected anywhere. And it was, she wasn't standing out so much. And what we chose to emphasize was the fact that she was what we call an interstitial candidate, okay? Interstitial, someone who fills in the spaces between other people. You know, if you have Yo-Yo Ma in the corner of one room and Albert Einstein in the corner of the, uh, the other, other room, uh, you know, the other corner of the room, who's the person who says, hey, let's do an icebreaker and talk to each other? What do you think about this? And what do you think about that? Who are those people that knit together a community or build a team? Mm -hmm. um, who are those people who reach across racial differences and socioeconomic differences? And honestly, that's what this young lady was. And that's what we just made sure that was emphasized in the essays so that, um, you know, ultimately she really got a lot of offers at kind of the Northwestern Duke level. Um, you know, 
they were happy to have someone like that in their community because you knew they knew if they put her on a freshman hall, she's the one who's going to say, "Hey, everybody, come over to my room for you know, let's whatever, um, let's get to know each other." She's just that kind of. So I had a question for you, but I I, I wanted to. Um because we're kind of on, on the track about like, you know, Joey with the perfect profile and why wouldn't he get like, so obviously not taking time. Is there anything else that you um, feel like is a common, I guess, um, thing that, that you happen to see about you kind of like these top performing students um, kind of ma really making kind of some silly mistakes along the way? Yeah, I, I, I rarely see the silly mistakes, although carelessness and putting it off until too late. Yeah. You know, honestly, this process of applying does not get easier after you start your senior fall, okay? It's not like you have more time after you start senior fall. Um, I do encourage you, hey, you, know, you can be working on your resume right now. You can be working on putting together, um, well, let me ask you, would, would rugby students put together some film highlights or something like that? Yeah, so definitely right now. So second semester junior year is when um, students, I would recommend that they are putting together their rugby resume, which is actually a, an, a combination of academic pieces along with rugby. And, and that should help them part of that process of doing it in the junior year is so it, I, I recommend that it's done in like a Google Docs so that they can continue to build and add. Right. And then when they're sharing that resume, for example, with a college coach, it can be updated. So like, for example, I have a student who just was invited to, let's say, Girls High School Americans, she would be able to add that to her resume. Or if she were to, let's say, um, start volunteering at her local you know, her food pantry, right. she would add that into um, that rugby resume. And yeah, I like the idea of kind of taking small bites at a really big you know, piece of cake, yeah. right? Like we have to do it small. Yeah, so do, doing it in March will make the process when we get to September, October, it's, it's mostly right. done, you know, right. now we're just like copying and pasting. <laughs> we're trying to use technology to make it easier on ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that I think is one of the biggest, uh, biggest things that kids can, they can lose track of that. And I think parents have a role, counselors have a role in helping them stay on track, maybe biting off some pieces of that cake along the way so that you're in better situation. One of the things that I have my kids do around this time, you might want to think about doing this, um, it's really common in college applications to ask for a supplemental essay on an extracurricular activity. And so I'm like, those are usually 150 to 250 words max. And I say, hey, write three of those. I want to hear about rugby. What do you, what do you have to say about that? I want to hear about uh, your your other activity, your job that you have after school yeah. or whatever, or maybe you babysit your sister all, every, every afternoon because your parents work. Let me hear about those things. Let's see what it's looking like. And you can go ahead and write some of those now. And then later in the summer, you'll, when you have a list of schools or you're applying in the fall, you're like, oh, I actually already wrote that essay. <laughs> Here, then I can copy and paste. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. silly mistakes, um, obviously, I think, or not even silly. It could be like, I can't believe this person turned this in, which I, you know, like oh, I think parents I don't. Do see, I do yeah. see inappropriate topics. You know, we, we would see sometimes inappropriate topics. And this gets into this common, common attitude, which I think is admirable. But kids say, I want to be authentic. You know, I want to be myself. Authenticity is really important to kids uh, and especially important to some kids that's great. And I don't want you to be inauthentic. I don't want you to be fake, but you want to be your best self. And you do have to think of it as a job interview. I will have students who sometimes you say, okay, I'm writing my personal statement. Oh, I need to tell them about how I, w how I was diagnosed with uh, depression in my sophomore year. And, and it goes on from there. And I started cutting and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, let me ask you a question. If you were walking down to the local McDonald's to interview for a job and they said, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Would you say to McDonald's, well, before I do the job interview, you really should know I was diagnosed with depression two years ago when I started cutting. Heck no, right? I mean, <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> why would you do that? <laughs> so uh, fortunately, you know, we can head that off at the pass, but there may be people out there who don't work with someone individually who, who would think, you know, this is so important. They need to know this. Right. Um, I don't disagree with that, but you want to be your best self. 
and you want to use the additional information part of the application to explain in a mature way, very factually, kind of dispassionately, if you will, um, any special circumstances that you need to explain. Um, and also understand that an employer or a college wants to be reassured that this, we understand this happened, but I have moved on, I have healed from that, I am capable of handling stress better or whatever. Um, so sometimes you'll see people start with something inappropriate. It's never appropriate to talk about, uh, for example, I call it the raging hormone essay. <laughs> I don't want to hear about how much you liked that girl. You know, I, 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 it's just not, you wouldn't, if you wouldn't talk about it in a job interview, don't bring it up in a college application. I've, I've had multiple, um, you know, cause maybe some of the classic question is like, what's an obstacle you've overcome, right? I've had lots of, um, breakup essays, <laughs> like getting over, which I, I feel, I feel, I feel for the, you know, cause I mean, I was in high school. I remember my first break. I mean, I know those are really impactful moments. Um, but this is, I actually was going to break. I remember one of the things I, I always took from, um, learning from your experience was, especially we talk about selective colleges, about the idea that these essays are this, this kind of one-time opportunity um, to, I mean, obviously show this admissions officer who you are, but about your brain and about how you think. So even if you are writing this beautiful, you know, well-written essay about, you know, <laughs> this breakup, I still don't really understand how, how you would analyze or think or apply this in college. And I think that's always that next step um, right. where students and families too, it's like, what might have worked in high school is great. And I see this on the rugby side too, right? Like you're great in high school, but we're, we need to think forward. Like, what are you going to be like in college or how would you, um, you know, challenge others in a class with your thinking? And, you know, that may not have anything to do with, you know, Susie broke my heart and it was really hard. And, but then I learned this. I mean, there might be a really good lesson in there, but then to focus more on the lesson and less about, we were standing in the rain and it, I was crying and you're like, Oh my God, this is like so, <laughs> so detailed about something that I would be willing to bet when you're in the admissions office. I mean, what, what could you learn about someone who wrote about something like that? Right. It's, I don't yeah. know. It, it's, um, I think part of what they're looking at is do you have good judgment about what you present to the admission office? And mm -hmm. I know they're dealing with 17 year olds um, and they're young. But at the same time, there are lots of 17 year olds who have better judgment than to talk about, um, you know, inappropriate, you know, breakup with a kid or something like that. So I absolutely agree with you. In the essays, it would be a mistake not to show your brain. You do need to show your heart. And by that, I mean um, how you relate to other people, how you contribute to the communities that you're in because most of these colleges are residential, at least for the first year, and they want to know, okay, what, what are you going to be like as a roommate? You're sharing a bedroom with somebody maybe, or you know, I'm, I'm admitting this person to my community. Um, how, how do you care about other people? How sensitive are you toward other people? Um, they're really looking for that side of your heart, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think emotional maturity and intellectual maturity are going to go a long way. You want to show both of those. So, for example, if you, uh, I don't know, if you have a great intellectual interest and you're sharing that in one essay, then maybe the next essay should be about a team that you were on and somebody who felt who, who wasn't included and how you helped them feel included. Or, you know, something that shows you reaching out either at a personal level or to your community. How do you knit that community together the way I talked about the the girl who was an interstitial candidate. Yeah. yeah. We emphasized, so. Could, could you give some, so I'm kind of jumping backwards because you were kind of saying if you have the, the credentials, right? So let's talk mm -hmm. about like GPA or something like that. Um, I've had some families ask before, um, for example, like, okay, we go to this public school, but we've heard it'll be better if we send them to that private school. Um, you know, or, or, or at, you know, my student has a three, seven, but I mean, if, if he went to that private, you know, if he went to the public school, he'd be a mm -hmm. 4.0. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, and I don't know if it gets too much into like the gaming in the system, but I guess, okay, so two things. Do you think it, you know, what do you think about students that are thinking about basically changing schools to kind of give them a leg up? I think that's one question. And my second question is, why do you think colleges even care about the GPA and test scores? Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Like what, like people are like, does it, what do you think it proves to the college when you have a student that has a 4.0 versus a 3.7? Um, or, or something, you know, like what, what do colleges use that those markers to like mean? Like what are the meanings from it? Does that make sense? Right. Well, really they're looking for what would predict success in college and the strongest correlation, and this is proven with studies, the strongest correlation and predictive factor for success in college GPA is your high school GPA. No matter where you're in high school, if you tend to be a 4.0 student, you're going to tend to be a 4.0 student in college. If you're a 3.5, you're going to tend to be, you know, there's a correlation there, and that's the strongest predictor, um, and that's why GPAs are important. Um, the test scores are also correlated with freshman year grades in college. Um, so there is a lot of controversy about those standardized tests, and some people, you know, many colleges are moving to test optional. I think it has less to do with the predictive validity of those test scores and more to do with the test company's failure to uh, accommodate security issues um, to perhaps balance their questions for different cultural backgrounds. Um, there's been a lot of, I think if the testing companies perhaps did this a little bit better, we'd see fewer colleges moving to test optional. But especially in the past decade, there's been a lot of, you know, questions about this, about the quality and integrity of the testing process, as we've seen. Yeah. Um, so, but those both are related to predicting. Guess what is not predictive of college success? I, I don't, I don't know. Interviews. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so while, you know, everybody wants to be judged on what they're good at, if I'm a I have a great GPA, but I have test anxiety. I don't do well on tests. Then I don't want to be judged on my test scores. I want to be judged on my GPA. And if my GPA and my test scores are a little bit lower, because you know what? I'm president of the student body, and I've got my own business, and I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in all these things. I have great soft skills. Everybody who meets me says, you are the mayor. You know, I'm going to elect you mayor. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be judged on your interview. <laughs> right. We all want to be judged on what we're strong on, but the colleges are actually doing studies with their current populations to determine, okay, uh, are students with this kind of preparation successful at my college, and is there a longitudinal study that we can do that shows the predictive validity of certain things coming into the college the other way, and GPA and test scores are valid. Um, to get back to your question about changing high schools, you know, I've been saying for years, don't make life decisions based on chances of admission to some college that's admitting 6% of their applicants. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you have to, every situation is going to be different, but the colleges know that they're going to get applications from thousands of different high schools with even more thousands of different teachers. Um, and they know how to look at the high schools and look at each kid within their context. I would argue what I see mostly, um, the most common thing I see is students who have gone to a high school that was a little bit too hard for them to rise to the top. That will hurt you every time. Hmm. Exeter has a bottom half of the class. Harvard Westlake has the bottom half of a class. The Westminster schools in Atlanta has a bottom half of a class. These are fine schools and anybody coming out of them is going to be well prepared for any college experience. But you do want to rise to the top. You do want to be some, somewhere you can make a change in your community. Um, I would argue if I'm looking at choosing a high school from, on the front end, um, is this something that would challenge a student appropriately. In other words, can they be successful in the challenge? Or are they just going to be average at that school? Hmm. Um, that's going to hurt them every time when they apply for admission to college. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You're making me think a lot. I, um, from a rugby standpoint, something we talked about fit. Uh, we do talk about um, finding the best 
rugby program where um, they can also be successful, right? And so it's kind of like, okay, do you want to go, you know, go to a, a college or play for a team where you're last on the depth chart, you know, so you're, you're grinding and doing everything you can, but never seeing any game time. Um, and I've had students that will say, yes, like that's going to drive me forward and make me the best player. Like that, that's, that's their choice, right? Is that's what they want. But then I've had others that are like, no, like I want to go to, I want to play. Like I'd rather play on a, let's say small college team and start right away, become a captain, get invested, you know, do that. Um, then go to maybe a, a D1A program and, and really kind of slog away for three years and maybe, um, you know, maybe play my senior year, something like that. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think that's interesting to think about. People always talk about the top half and then it is about, you know, if you're in one of these like super high powered schools, you, you obviously get access to lots of great things, um, but you're compared to those within that school. So kind of back to even just from the very beginning of our conversation, Joey might have had perfect grades, perfect test scores, but you know what, like, so do 20 other students in his own class, in his own senior class, and they're all applying to the same college. Um, and that yeah. makes it difficult, right, for an admissions person um, to look at 20 of those students that all have um, the, the qualifications um, to run this race. Um, but how do we, you know, maybe they can't admit 20 from this one high school. Right, um, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and you also told, I, I love when I have these conversations, they make me think about like different connections, but um, like, so last month I was just in rugby, New Jersey's um, combine. This is their sixth year they've done it. And they, you know, they'll do like a fitness test. They'll go ahead and do um, vertical jumps and max um, you know, bench and things like that. Um, it makes me think a lot about how I tell families like those, those metrics, they're helpful um, cause you know, for maybe a coach that doesn't get to see you, you know, right away or get to see you, um, wow, like that, that kid ran a four, four forty. That's really fast. He may be a tear, he may have terrible hands and like, can't catch a ball, you know, <laughs> like those are all like extra things to look at. But even from the start, when you see someone who's maybe super fast is very strong, very fit. I mean, those are kind of just the foundational pieces. Like when we can coach some of the other things onto it, but could this person hang on our team? You know, if they're really out of shape, if they're really, you know, exceptionally, you know, slow or weak, can they really add to this program? And if I am, you know, a top rugby, if I'm Lindenwood, if I am, you know, Cal Berkeley, uh, they need to be able to hang with that team. Um, so I think the metrics are a part of it. And like, I think any family who's out there, you start looking at these recruit questionnaires in any sport, uh, you know, so we're talking football, we're talking soccer, we are going to talk about your height, your weight, your uh, 100 meter dash times, you know, your, your um, vertical jump, because, and people have been using those for years, because they at least potentially predict some things, right? Like, okay, you, you could at least kind of run with our team or not. Um, yeah, it's absolutely the same. It, the, the GPA and the test scores are the metrics. Um, to some degree, what teachers say about you. Are you one of the best math students I've ever had in my career? Are you one of the best this year? Um, you know, those are kind of metrics that it's exactly the same. I think it's a great analogy to use. And I think people can understand it, that the metrics don't get you all the way there. That's the first hurdle. And then, then we go through some others. Um, so I'm, I'm getting kind of down because I don't, I don't want to keep you too long, but um, I, I guess I, I would love to kind of wrap things up with, I mean, you know, let's say you're in front of these families and, and I've seen some of these, right, where the entire list is uber selective schools. Um, is there like one tip or one thing you really want them to think about um, when they're about to embark on um, I guess, this path of applying to these very selective colleges. Mm -hmm. Well, I know you know that we always want people to have a more strategic list. I, I say sometimes a list that's, you know, whatever, every Ivy League college plus Stanford and Duke and, you know, that's a dumb list, right? <laughs> it's a stupid list. <laughs> um, we want a smart strategic list uh, where you, you know, if you've got the numbers to play at that top level, 
great, go for it. Go for the appropriate colleges. Um, but if you are, you know, because they take so few, it's highly competitive for everybody. So you also want to have a strategic list that includes colleges that are less competitive academically for admission, um, that also have the characteristics you're looking for, you know, that have that rugby team you want to play for, or that have that dance group that you might actually be part of. Um, so I just, that's the first thing I say is have a good list, but let's just say you've got the numbers to play, you know, that you are looking, you're Joey and you've got great credentials and you've done everything you needed to do for 12 years to, to you've earned the right to be in any applicant pool out there, right? If you don't go for it, you'll never know. We talked a little bit about, um, you know, the world will say no to us um, and we don't need to say no to ourselves, okay? Um, if you don't try out for the team, you'll never know if you made it. Um, you, some people just limit themselves up front. Uh, so I do think you should try. Um, that being said, do a great job. You know, do the best, the best audition you can, the best combine performance you can. So that right. you that you have better shot. Um, I guess the other thing that I would just say is, is you can't underestimate the importance of the positive selection of people that are gonna build their community in a particular way. I worked with a young lady a few years ago that was admitted to an Ivy League school. I didn't think she was going to be admitted. She had the credentials, okay, they all have the credentials sometimes, but what it turned out had happened was that they had, this Ivy League school had expanded their dance program. So they had a significant, they had opened new facilities and they actually probably swept in, you know, 10 dancers that, that had the credentials but might not have stood out otherwise. And she was a great dancer. Hmm. So, you know, okay, we got lucky here with the institutional priorities. Um, so that, that plays such a big role. Uh, you know, they're choosing from among qualified candidates. Yeah. I mean, I love that there was, I think we'd probably talked about it, but there was that, um, there's like a Malcolm Gladwell talk about, um, really picking the number two college is, is, is a better, you know, like possibly leads to more success, you know, and I think it's interesting. Um, there's all, obviously all this focus on these top like five, 10, whatever, 15 colleges. Um, and I've certainly had students, you know, lots of, for example, on the women's side, um, you know, three Ivy League institutions are varsity women's rugby programs. So you have girls that are going to Dartmouth and Harvard and Brown. Um, they're qualified, but I do think that it's a question of they're working 10 times hard, you know, potentially, and I'm not saying this, I have this as a fact, but I think there are certainly those students that, um, get into very competitive colleges where maybe at their high school, they were kind of like cream of the crop. It was kind of easy to get those A's and, e you know, kind of everything came easy. And all of a sudden they're in a place where they're no longer the top dog because everyone was the top dog. And that can be really hard um, mm -hmm. mentally, you know, to kind of make the shift from being like, I used to kind of be like, you know, the, the man, or I was the woman around here. And now I'm, everyone else around me is getting this class and I'm not. Um, I've had some students um, in the past, not rugby, but, you know, really had to rethink whether or not they're in the right place, um, you know, for them, right? That focus on fit that I know both of us really focus on. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure when you're, I mean, in your time at Princeton, there were students, did you feel like there were students that um, may have struggled with that? Like, oh my God, I won, I won the, I won the prize. Like I'm here. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh shoot, like, they still have to go to school. Like they still have to do the work. Does that make sense? Like, it's not like, yes, I did it. I'm done. It's like, actually, that's when you start. Right. I, I, I'd have to say in my personal experience, I absolutely saw a lot of that um, recalibration, you know, pretty darn quickly. You're not mentioning your SAT scores to anybody else freshman week, right? Because <laughs> Oh, mine are like the lowest I've ever, <laughs> you know, everybody else. Uh, so you, you, I think there was personally, you know, just as a student there, and of course this was a generation ago or two, but um, there was a recalibration where you very quickly said, oh, okay, I get it. As an admission, as an admission person and in making that decision, I think that particular adjustment is almost difficult to predict sometimes. Um, I think we would see students that we thought they might have trouble with this adjustment for a variety of reasons. Maybe because I know my college and they don't have the support for students who 
I don't know, they're in a wheelchair and they're gonna have difficulty navigating parts of this campus. Um, and I don't mean to call out Princeton, they actually, we did have students in wheelchairs. We do have students in wheelchairs. <laughs> but you know, I could see, for yeah. example, where I might be aware of some limitation that my college has that's not gonna serve this student well. You know, maybe they're coming from a socioeconomic background or a family cultural background that I'm just not sure is gonna make a great transition and they're gonna be, they're gonna feel very lost. Um, we don't want students to fail, right, in the yeah. admission process. But, um, but anyway, so I definitely saw that at, at a personal level. And I think, for me, it comes down to personality issues. So obviously, a lot of people are competitive, right? They are competitive, and they like to win, okay? And it's important to them to be a winner. That's different from a personality that isn't thinking about winning, isn't thinking about competition academically, but is thinking about oh my gosh, I just want to be with all these smart people because I'm going to learn so much more. It's going to, it's going to, you know, they're just there to literally gorge on the, uh, on the opportunity, the intellectual, the faculty, the, the other classmates. And they, they love it when somebody's smarter than they are. I had mm -hmm. one young lady who, who uh, uh, wrote about in her essay, wrote about having arguments and, you know, arguments with her friends and, you know, it started in elementary school. Who would win a battle between Darth Vader and, you know, whoever else <laughs> from, this, you know, from this other sci-fi, you know, genre? What, what, you know, and they just kind of kept that up through high school. And one of the last lines of her essay was, I can't imagine a better way to spend a Saturday night than arguing with my best friends and having my mind changed. Hmm. If I were to just got, I got goosebumps a little bit. Yeah. That's a great, I mean, that's a great way to think. If I were an admission officer, I would admit her for that one line because that's who I want at my school. Now, everybody's going to be putting that into their essay. <laughs> 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 I hate to tell you, but we kind of know about these things and, you know, <laughs> people who are in admissions, they'll, they'll, they'll recognize it. So don't do that. But, um, but the attitude is different, right? The attitude, I want to mix it up intellectually. I want to, I want to be challenged. So I think if you're the kind of person who would be undermined or unhappy about not being first or not winning, you should think about where you go. And maybe you'd be better off going to a place where you are going to be in the top 10% of the class. Or if you're a pre-med student, you know, we always talk about this. If you're thinking about med school, you don't want to be in the bottom half of the class at Duke. You want to be, you want to go to the appropriate match college where you're going to rise to the top, where faculty members are going to want to have relationships with you and you're going to have opportunities that someone in the bottom half of the class might not get offered. Um, and I do, I do think the, the Gladwell book um, that you're referring to, you know, where you go is not who you will be. Well, that, that's the Frank Bruni book. I think that's the Malcolm Frank Gladwell Bruni. one is like Dave, David and Goliath. Is it that one? David. Okay, both of those books talk about this kind of finding the right match, the right fit, where, you, where you're successful and you build confidence, and then you step up to the higher levels of competition, right? Yeah. If you're a beginning marathoner, you don't start with the New York Marathon, right? You don't right. start there um, right. because you'll just get defeated and discouraged. You, you build your way up. You work your way up to you work your way up to the Olympic competition. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would like to kind of, I think um, having this conversation so great, it, it, it reminds me a little bit to remind myself because um, I'm a, uh, I, you know, I would say I'm guilty of kind of sometimes referring to college admissions. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, how, how, how do you win this game? Right. And it's a lot about this focus on winning. Um, and a lot of it's a focus on like acceptance, like, oh, if we can just get this acceptance, like everything will be great. Um, when mm -hmm. truly there's still a lot of work that comes after that. And I think even just to have um, students and families think beyond just, okay, what are all the levers we're gonna pull to get this acceptance? But then also think about, okay, well, but if your, your student gets in, can, will they also be happy, you know, will, will they be happy there? Will they thrive there? Will they enjoy their time? Um, and learn and, and grow, or is it simply about this one thing? Because I also think if we, um, as, as counselors, as, as students, as families, I mean, we, we don't have time, but I mean, I think that the, the thing that happened with the college admission scandal that's happening right now, it's because of this, like, 
insane mm -hmm. focus on just this one thing that's like, if I do this, my life is perfect. And then it's like, well, if I don't do this, then my life is over. And that it shouldn't be all about, you know, um, you know, this one thing. So I think back to your original um, recommendation about making sure that that list is, is um, you know, diverse and it has lots of different, you know, places for the student to really stand out and do the things that they want. Um, it's important for those reasons too. Because every I have a friend, a mom friend. She always says with with her son when they're kind of having a bad day, she's like, "I just want you to, I'm going to give him a win. Like he's got to have a win. And what's that going to be? Like today, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get to go spend an extra 30 minutes on the playground, something like that, right? And he has a great time. He needed that win for the day, you know. And I think kind of shifting that mentality even to high school. It's like, look, they're slogging it out. They, they didn't get the score they wanted, even though it's a great score. They, they get a, a B on one class and they feel awful. And I always try to spend a lot of time saying, you know what, like you work really hard for that B, like be proud of it, you know, mm -hmm. and be happy with what you've done instead of this kind of like, oh, well you got that B, so oh well, you know, like. It's, it's over. <laughs> yeah, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that with sports. You know, you had one bad game. No one's like, well, get off the team. You know, yeah. you're off, you, you made that mistake. But sometimes I think in college admissions and, and focus, it's like, I, I think some students might feel the pressure of like, oh my God, I, I don't want to make a mistake, you know, because if I do, I'll, I'll get a B. And then that means I'm not going to get Stanford, which means my life is over. It's like this weird, like crazy connection. It's, and you're like, very Wait. black and white. Yeah, very black and white thinking, you know, all or nothing. Um, I, I hear what you're saying. The other thing I would just mention is if, if, I'm not an expert on adolescent development or, or, or psychology, but I did do a project once um, where I looked at the connection between college admission and parenting and the adolescent development of a child. And one of the things to be aware of as a parent is that if you, you know, if you're in your forties and your child is in the late teens, Sometimes there's actually a, a process going on here of individuation where you begin to do the final separation from your child. We talk about we were admitted to Berkeley. We yeah. are applying to, you know, uh, Harvard. That's actually a sign. It's not, it's not that you're wrong to say that, but it is a sign of that last stage of individuation. You're still so tight together. And I think what we saw in this scandal is that unfortunately college admission plays right into this. It might be the first really significant thing in your child's life that you've got no control over. And there are people who will try to control it. Oh yeah. Where they can. <laughs> and unfortunately people who go fishing sometimes get a bite from a crooked coach or something. Now the, um, the other thing that's going on is as parents in that age group, we may be kind of looking back and saying, wow, I'm starting to get closer to retirement than, to the, you know, than I was. Yeah. Um, my kids are starting to leave home. Have I done what I needed to do as a parent? And somehow the admission decisions become this stamp of approval on my parenting. Hmm. I, my kid got into Harvard. I did my job and I can take pride in that. And I, I would challenge you to rethink that, um, you know, if that's part of your thinking, but, but just understanding that this really hits certain psychological stages for people, yeah. the admission process really pokes everybody in their tender spots, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it, it's, I'm like, whenever I do these, and I think people, everyone always says this, but it's like, anytime you have a conversation with someone, especially if you have like a limited amount of time, you always get to some really juicy bit at the end. I'm like, Oh, like, I love, like, I love, we'll have to do this again. Cause I would love to hear, um, just in general, like, um, maybe on our next chat, we'll talk a little bit about parents specifically, you know, and, and their role in the ways that, um, they can actually kind of hurt their children in this process. Um, even yeah. when they're trying to help. Cause I think that's something on the recruitment side. I see a lot is I push really, really hard for parents to completely step out. They're a part of it. They're brought in, you know, they're at the table, but they're like non-speaking, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you're, if, if I'm Susie and I'm emailing a coach, I'm emailing the coach and I'm CCing my parent, but it's not mom emailing the coach, answering the question that the coach is asking. 
Um, mm. Cause I think that quickly tells the coach um, the parent wants this more than the student or mm. when I get this student on campus, well, is mom going to be making these decisions for her? You know, or is she going to have to call mom every time? And, and that is, especially with college recruitment, like we do need some separation because we, I mean, I've, I've definitely had parents go on a tour, uh, you know, maybe an official tour and, and the parents, the one walking with the coach and asking questions and talking about, you know, son or daughter. And he's like way in the back and you're like, and then the coach will later be like, this is going to be a headache. Like, right. I don't want to deal with this, this dad. I'm right. not going to recruit this kid because of the dad. And that's where you're like, Oh God, like if I could have talked to him beforehand, like don't we you know, like, a- drop your kid off and go get a <laughs> coffee. Like this is a good time for your student to, you know, um, to take ownership of that. Cause back to what you're saying, it's, it's that dad was not, was scared if he let his son take over, his son was going to lose this recruiting opportunity. Right. And we saw the control, like I need to control it. Yeah. We saw this in the scandal, the the admission scandal. That's it's the, I call it fear parenting. You know, when you're making decisions about what you're doing for your child out of complete fear that they're going to uh, lose an opportunity. Um, And without understanding the full implications of that and the damage that does to the child. I see children who become very passive aggressive. Well, you know what, mom, you dominated me throughout my life and I have not rebelled. I love you, but no, I'm not coming home for holidays. And no, you're not going to see very much of me as soon as I'm out of here. You know, it's sad. Um, You can get passive aggressiveness. You can get, um, lack of confidence or just train it's called learned helplessness if I learn that no matter what I do it's not good enough for for mom or dad because they're going to go behind me and clean up the essay and clean up this and you know if they're going to be redoing everything I do eh, why should I try um, so there's a lot of damage that goes on. We should talk about it some, maybe some other time. Yeah. Uh, maybe we get an expert on on adult <laughs> development, helicopter parenting, or they call it even snowplow parenting now, um, you know, because they're a little snowflake. We got to push everything out of the way. Um, well, and, and now, I think now as a new parent, like I, I get it a little bit more. Like I, you do want to like you're trying like make your like your child's life great. I mean, I, I get that. Like, of course you love them and you want, so I, I, I have a lot more empathy for that. And I think that is where it'll probably be really hard when, when, you know, when Libby is 18, that separation thing, like you said, I think it probably takes, um, it, it takes some time. It's not like you wake up one day and you're like, cool. Like they really are off to college. It, it takes a little bit of letting go little by little. Um, yeah. of like, okay. Like this process in, in might be right. So this college admissions process, in a perfect world, we would have parents say, like, perfect parents for me are when they're like, we're, we're going to be involved because we, we want to know what's going on, but this is up to Joey, right? Joey should be the one um, in a per- the, the perfect students I have. They're the ones reaching out to me saying, hey, um, I just, I got my SAT score. I'd love to talk about it. Um, when, when can we meet? It's like they're taking ownership of even this process. It's not oh, well, mom's the one who set up all the meetings and I just kind of show up and I'm kind of there, but I know mom's taking notes, so whatever, she'll tell me what to do. Um, it's really easy for me to spot those families. Yeah. And I already know this is going to be a stretch for them to have the student get in front of a coach by himself mm-hmm. and talk honestly about like, yes, like I want to be a part of your program. This is what I do and be able to, um, kind of advocate for themselves without mom or dad, you know, kind of like telling them what to say. Um, so, yeah, well, thank you so much for your time. There's so many, I just, I love having just like my brain starts going like a million different directions, but, um, we'll definitely do this again. Um, if you are, um, in, uh, well, I guess you, you work remotely, so it doesn't have to be in your area, but if you are interested in getting in touch with, uh, with hope, I'll include all her information. Um, on the notes page, uh, Murtaugh College Consulting. And, um, yeah, feel free to reach out. Hope is the best. So if you want to reach out to Hope, um, sometimes she gets full, but maybe you can you can squeeze in with her. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Karen. We'll talk again. All right, we'll talk soon. Okay, bye. Bye.